Hey everyone, Grant here. So the other day, the Benz and I were all together and we're talking about things we might want to bring up on the podcast. And one of the things that Eater mentions has been on his mind is what the goal of education even should be. I mean, we're optimizing something here, right? We have a notion of what makes for a good class or what makes for a bad explanation. But what's the end goal, right? What's the thing we want to happen to students during their trajectory through this system? And Stenhaug brings up, you know, if you guys want to talk about this, you should really read this paper by David Labory. It's called, let me pull it up here. It's called Public Goods, Private Goods, The American Struggle Over Educational Goals. And obviously that's what we're going to talk about today. But I'm not expecting that you guys have read it, so let me just give a real brief overview, because there's three main pieces of terminology that we keep turning back to, and those are going to be important. So Labory, the author, lays out these three possible goals that education might have, and that historically different people have wanted it to have. The first goal is what he calls democratic equality. That is, that the goal of education should be to make good citizens. If we're going to be ruled by the majority, let's make sure that that majority knows how to rule us, right? Now, the second possible goal is what he calls social efficiency. And by that, he means when people come out of school and they enter the workforce, we want them to be as productive as possible. You know, as you're fitting them somewhere into the economy, it's kind of an efficient allocation of people's skills that they've acquired over the course of their education and where those are actually needed. And the third goal he puts out there is social mobility. And this is very much a goal more from the perspective of the individual, like a parent or maybe the student themselves about wanting that student to get ahead in life. That once they exit school and they're a member of society, they have a high standing in society, whatever you might think that to mean, which might mean a higher salary or just a higher status in another sense or whatever might have you. So these are the three goals, right? Democratic equality, social efficiency, and social mobility. And of course, he goes into much more detail if you want to know, like read the paper yourself. But one of the major themes in this paper is he identifies a certain shifting of those goals. You know, he makes the claim that it used to be that democratic equality was much higher up there in people's minds as the prominent reason for having a public schooling system. And that more and more, the goal is shifted towards being that of social mobility. And the reason for the title of the paper here, Public Goods, Private Goods, he views democratic equality and social efficiency both to be public goods, things where if schools accomplish that, everybody in society is exposed to those benefits, right? We are all exposed to the benefits of good citizens. We are all exposed to the benefits of an efficient allocation of skill sets into the economy. But social mobility, that is much more of a private good. At least in this framework that he lays out, the benefits of succeeding on the social mobility front are really only something that certain individuals are exposed to. So that's the broad framework. And for the first part of the conversation, we were kind of hitting that paper head on. And I'll be honest, I was listening back and it just seemed kind of, uh, well, it seemed like it would be boring or out of context for those who hadn't read the paper. And like I said, I'm not really assuming you have. So I'm going to go ahead and jump us right in where we're transitioning away from a direct hit on the paper to a more general discussion of this topic, which, I mean, is pretty thought provoking. whether the goals are mutually exclusive or not. I'm actually more interested in kind of starting from what do you all think the purpose of education ought to be? Yeah. Because I think that's where it gets interesting. Because I mean, the paper is is coming at this from the standpoint of there's lots of different ideas for reform in education. People are putting forth different ideas. There's battles over things like redistributing funds for education. There's battles over things like busing students or school vouchers. Things like these are sort of these political battles. And a lot of times people sort of look at those with the lens of what is going to be most effective or what is going to be the best learning outcome. And a lot of the things that we've talked about before are centered around you know, what provides the best learning or learning outcome and things like that. And I think the point of this paper is that the reason why you know so many smart minds have been put together to try to improve education, and it seems like we haven't cracked that nut is because uh, people come at it with a different goal in mind. And that goal isn't always explicit. I have a very clear answer to this, that before reading the paper, when we started talking about doing a podcast about it, that I was going to kind of come in with hard. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. To me, the goal of education should be producing people who can contribute meaningfully to the economy. To the point where here's how I might even measure it. 
If you want to compare school A and school B, and if we can run parallel universes so you can actually be experimental about this, you take the salaries of all of the people who come out of school A, right? And you consider what they are, and you take the salaries of all the people that come out of school B, and you can't directly compare those because, you know, maybe A was coming from a rich neighborhood and influence of your parents on your own job prospects and such. But if you run the parallel universe where you swap all the students, you know, you have students that originally would have gone to school B go to school A, and those that would have gone to A go to B, and you just do a comparison for what's the diff, right? What is the change in the salaries of those batches of students depending on their school? That's a measure of the quality of school. And I think that would be a very kind of controversial, like not a lot of people would agree with me on that. That's so controversial to me. That is just, that's bonkers, Grant. All right, all right. Because what you're saying is that the goal of education is to produce economic outcomes. And the reason I should say, I'm using salary basically as a proxy for like, how much are you contributing? And it's not the best proxy in the world, right? but it's like better than a lot of other things if you want to put numbers to it, where it, to me, is about what are these people capable of producing for their peers, for the world around them, once they are adults, once they're members of society. So not to be too stuck to the paper, but I'm curious, Grant, does it seems to me that you're describing Lavery's goal to social efficiency and workers and tax payers. Do you see that? Yeah, reading that, like the social efficiency point, definitely that resonated hard with me. And, you know, I'm not going at this where I want to be put into one of those buckets and like advocate for the, one of the three buckets he puts out. But that one sort of vibrated a chord within me, so to speak. Okay, so there's some subject or there's some activity that can take place in a school. I don't know, let's call it art or something like some yeah. form of art. And Absolutely. let's 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 this is not the case. But let's imagine that it does not contribute significantly, or at least it's not the best use of a school's time in order to maximize salary potential of a student. Like you still find value in art. How do you... There's economic value in art. There's huge economic value in art. Like consider how much money goes towards film, right? Or not, not even that, but just the sensibilities and the tastes that people can gain by having an exposure to art. It makes it so that they appreciate things like design, appreciate what constitutes good choices or not in purely aesthetic ways. But undoubtedly, an hour of art is wasted time over an hour of teaching computer science for someone that is purely maximizing salary potential of students. Oh, no, I wholly disagree with that. I think if you have no artistic sentiments and only engineering sentiments and you go in the world, I think you're going to be less productive. I wholly believe that. Okay, let's not get caught up here. There must be something that is valuable that schools should do that will not be rewarded by the labor market and that will not be reflected in this kind of viewpoint that you're taking. In my mind, definitionally, there's not. So obviously, I'm taking a hard stance, but I really do kind of believe it. I'll give you an example of something that was valued in my own schooling experience, but I think shouldn't have been and tossed out. And you can measure this by how maybe economically useless it was, is in seventh grade, the category of social studies for me was Utah studies. We were going to learn more about our home state of Utah. Uh -huh. And a weirdly large portion of that class was spent understanding the Great Salt Lake and the ecology within it, which centers largely around brine shrimp. And I don't think anyone got use out of understanding brine shrimp better. Maybe they had a sense of like loyalty to Utah, or they had some sense of trivia knowledge about like where they were from. Let's go Utah. By my test, that one should have been replaced by some other kind of class. So here's the thing. I mean, I broadly agree with you, Grant. I think I would refine it a bit and perhaps you would as well. But I do worry in agreeing with you, especially your, your hard stance, so the thing with the brine shrimp, if you look at it as a pure economic value situation and you say, well, knowing about brine shrimp is not valuable, you are kind of leaving behind that idea of making good citizens. Mm -hmm. And so if you live in Utah, um, as most people in Utah do, and you have this Great Salt Lake in your backyard and you have some local politics that's you know democratic and majority controlled, it behooves people, or at least some critical mass of people, to sort of understand the ecological ramifications of various proposed policies. And so how do you get that if everyone is sort of optimizing for what is best for me? Now, some people, what's best for them is going to be studying brine shrimp because they love brine shrimp. And this is one area where I would differ from you, because I think if you love brine shrimp, you don't set that aside to go pursue finance because you can make more money there. I think it should be available to some. More than anything, the goal I have in mind would mean a wider variety of classes and less of a monolithic look. So the democratic equality point you bring up is a really good one. In reading the paper, I think it really kind of did help refine and maybe alter some of the ways I was thinking about these things. Because I don't know about you guys, but when the first possible goal that Labore brings up is this democratic equality one, that the purpose of education is creating good citizens. 
That kind of stuck out to me. That almost seemed odd because I had never really seen that discussed before. Is that your take? No, I, I mean, I'd seen that discussed before. And, and, and that is the tension that I feel, which is everything that I think about in terms of education does drive me towards connecting to people to a meaningful life. And it sounds like you would measure the meaning of that life in terms of economic output. I think I would find a more nuanced measure. But, but connecting to someone to a meaningful life. And I think part of that is you do need to learn some things in order to be able to behave in, responsibly in a society. But wasn't it weird to have that as the main goal of education? Elaborate's not suggesting that that is the main goal. He's suggesting historically it is a goal that some have advocated for and tension comes from that sometimes. Yeah, thank you. That's a needed clarification, definitely. And I think it's also telling. I mean, he cites to Marx and you know has some sort of uh, socialist tendencies in the paper. So he's coming at it from a particular perspective. What about social mobility? Go on. What about it? Do... Well, do you guys think that schools should serve a role in providing equal opportunity for students and just people in general? And if so, where does it fit into like your discussion so far of maximizing economic output? Yeah, this is actually something I struggled with because I saw the sort of um, social mobility uh, and the social efficiency to be very closely related. And in fact, I had a hard time telling the distinction there because social mobility suggests that everyone is free to choose what they study and they're going to do so in order to make the best decisions that they're able to, to maximize their ability to be successful in the economy or in life more generally. And the social efficiency says, as far as I could tell, is sort of saying that the school system ought to be constructed such that it produces a variety of people at different skill levels to fill different jobs. And in my mind, those both kind of get you to the same place. I feel you 100%. I found it hard to think practically about what that distinction would be. And I could kind of see the distinction that he wanted to make. And a lot of it seemed to center on when social mobility is the goal, perceived as this private good, you have this zero-sum game dynamic where there are necessarily winners and losers because some people will have the higher standings in society, some people will have lower standings. And that the effect that has is that in an educational system, everything's constructed such that there's a notion of higher or lower, higher education, lower education, higher grades, lower grades. You've got this strict gradation, this strict hierarchy about where students fit. And supposedly that's reflected in what the social standing that they might have later on are. Or if you're a consumer hoping for the best for your child, you want there to be a notion of best and lower and higher. And I didn't I see buy it. it that way. Yeah, I didn't buy it that way. I, th I thought that view's position in society is much more linear than it really is, as if there is a notion of this person has a higher social standing, this person has a lower social standing. And it also suggests that the sizes of those groups can't change. So for example, it suggests that if we educate people better and educate more people and bring people up more and... We get to a place where, you know, everyone today has the same knowledge and ability and problem solving ability and all these, you know, valuable skills that somehow there would still be, everyone would still have the same job. Uh, and I, I don't buy that. I mean, I think if there were more people in the world who could search for a cure for cancer, we would have more people searching for a cure for cancer. It wouldn't just be like, well, we'd pick the best people of those people who could. Yeah, absolutely. And more importantly than that, if you actually do look out in the world, while there do exist types of hierarchy, right? Maybe especially within a company, you have this notion of which people are considered of a higher standing or broadly in society. If some people view like for some reasons, like doctor is above like janitor, if that's the classic thing. More than any of those like stereotypical things, there's just forms of goodness in different ways where you have some little hierarchy there, some little hierarchy here. And you can imagine a utopian society in which everybody is the best at their own very, very niche field, not at the exclusion of others' social standings, right? That there doesn't need to be a notion of my kid will be of the highest status because he got the highest credential because it could just be that he specialized in a thing and he is the specialist in that. And the way that things were presented here, and Stenhaug pushed back on me if this isn't how you read it, just seems antithetical to the premise of specialization, that you can have many different people in very good situations without it being zero sum, without a need for one of them to be considered on top of the other in some graded way. I just want to make sure I'm totally understanding. Can you, as simply as possible, as if I was like four, summarize you said, I don't buy it. What don't you buy? That these two are in tension? Here's what I don't buy. So if the goal of education is to be a private good for the consumer, to make it so that their child can have the best position in life, that that necessarily implies a desire for a hierarchical output. 
that you as the consumer want there to be a notion of some students being better than others, some students having a higher education than others. Ostensible premise being that if there's a pure democratic equality, you know, all students come out and they look exactly the same. There's no way for your own kid to be ahead for him to have the highest social standing in the world. Oh, I buy it so hard. Great. You went to Stanford. Like you wanted to get into Stanford, didn't you? Sure, sure. Part of what must have attracted you to Stanford was its exclusivity. And you wanted to get in, so you wanted to be at the top of the pile at the whatever cutoff point they make on the application essays. Like I think, I think there's many examples of ways in which we want there to be a hierarchy and we're benefited from it. I mean, I think it makes a really interesting general point, which is that people at the top of the hierarchy often advocate for these things like private schools, tracking in schools, special programs, and then the disadvantaged do less of that. They want more inclusive. They want to focus more on diversity. And I think that's really, really interesting. And that feels true from my experience. So absolutely. There's the, like the strongest point he makes. And the reason that this resonates so hard is that we we see this hierarchy in schools that there is. And I felt that as a student, 100% the desire, like I want to go to the best school or like, I want to get the best grades. And all students end up kind of feeling this tension that there is some notion of the good and they must achieve that good, whether it takes the form of an A or a college they, they get into. So I think like people reading this paper, once you get to that point, you're like, yeah, yeah, that is how schools are. And yeah, that does seem messed up. And all of that is correct. What I don't buy is the attribution of the cause to that being school treated as a private good, that this is somehow a necessary consequence of school being treated based on people wanting a better life for their children as individuals, rather than viewing it for the polity or for the community at large. I also kind of wasn't following. There's this notion in the paper he talks about, it's a competition and everyone is fighting for a better position in this hierarchy. And so that competition and that need to get a better position is what leads to having stratification in terms of, you know, there's elementary school, then high school, then college, then postgraduate, and then like differentiation between that. Like there's better colleges, there's worse colleges, there's better school districts, there's worse school districts. Uh, and then tracking within schools, you know, there's an honors program, there's a non-honors program. And all of that is driven by this desire that everyone presumably has as a consumer of education to get the best and to move up. And those are all signals that you are moving up and everyone wants to move up and be at the top of that hierarchy, presumably so that they can then get a position in society where they are earning the most. And I kind of don't necessarily buy that because to me, that's not everyone's goal. I mean, that is kind of the engine that drives a capitalist economy, mm -hmm. but it's not the case that everyone's goal is to make as much money as possible and they're motivated by nothing else. If that were true, I wouldn't be working at a nonprofit, for example. Do you agree that this is the current state of schools, that this fierce competition is a true take on the American system as it stands? That competition exists, yeah. And I think it's participated in by, uh, obviously not by everyone. I think some people just sort of, well, I don't know. I mean, I opted out of it. I thought it was sort of silly. Hmm. And I don't think it's necessary, even in a very capitalistic mindset where everyone is sort of advocating for their own. I mean, because society doesn't need, and it's not healthy, I think, for people to sort of try to put themselves into a strict rank ordering, <laughs> where it's this linear, like top to bottom. I think people are going to find ways to, or people ought to be finding ways to sort of contribute to society in a way that is best for them. So everyone is going to have their own interests and likes and dislikes and things that they're sort of naturally attracted to or, or have certain abilities that they enjoy expressing. Folks ought to have, I think, sort of the freedom to explore those things and find their niche in society, mm -hmm. even if it's not the top of the heap for whatever definition of top you might use, which, you know, the education system has one of those. But, you know, the reality is that in industry, you know, some of the most successful people got out of the education system early, you know, didn't go all the way through grad school and post-grad and on and on. I fear what's going to happen here is either you and I are just going to be agreeing pretty hard on a lot of things. At least this is the sense I have so far. What I'm trying to do is figure out where you guys are exactly disagreeing with Labory and mm -hmm. if you actually are. Because to my mind, Labory is suggesting that social mobility is a potential goal of the education system. People advocate for it and they advocate for certain things to take place in schools and in the system more widely as a result of that goal. He also says this hasn't come up yet, but he says that that's increasingly becoming the dominant goal that we are optimizing under. And then the follow on is he thinks that's a bad thing. He thinks public education is the way to go over private education. And that's like the linear train of thought that I follow Labory on. And I feel him completely. I don't know the private versus public where we should be focusing. I'm not sure. But it's not clear to me you guys are disagreeing with any of that in particular. 
Sometimes it seems like you guys are taking Labry as making normative statements when he's being mostly descriptive here, I think. Mm, I, okay, that's definitely true. So first of all, listeners should definitely take a look at the paper for themselves and not, not necessarily trust the reviews here. And you, I think you're right. That very, very little of it is a normative take on things. And he's just trying to describe the state, the state of what different people's goals are and the state of what those goals looked like in the 19th century versus what they look like now. And I think he makes a very compelling case that the goal of democratic equality and citizenship has been on the decline and that the private good goal for one's parents' own children as individuals has been on the uprise. Here's where I disagree a little bit with conclusions that he does make. And towards the conclusion, I think in the last in the last couple of pages of the paper, it definitely does get more normative where he points to problems in the education system, basically things like how people will chase credentials, even though the values of those credentials seem to be decreasing. And they'll often do it with little regard for whether there's an education that backs it up, right? I think a lot of us have this loose sense in mind that a lot of college students might go through with the main goal of getting a degree that's some kind of ticket into the economy later with less of a consideration for actually remembering that the things that they learned in those classes. And, and he sums this up very well with describing it as a like, will this be on the test mentality, right? How if that is a question being asked, will this be on the test? That's a sign that someone cares not about their own educational outcomes. And that resonates, right? I think that's, that is a problem. And he hits it very directly as a part of this state. Where I disagree is saying that this is a problem associated with people treating education as a private good. To me, I see that as a point of irrationality in the markets. I think this is a point where there's lots of times when people doing what they think is best for themselves is not at all best for themselves. And certainly any kind of bubble dynamic that happens, this is the case, right? Where you have people chasing after something, thinking that it is an asset that will accrue more, and they devote a lot of resources and a lot of assets of their own towards accruing this, whether that's internet stock in the 80s, real estate pre-2008, or cryptocurrencies right now, or whatever it might be, any kind of like bubble dynamic where there's this chasing, all of that, sure, it's stemming from like private goods, but I don't think it's a necessary consequence of treating the thing from a consumer standpoint. I think it's a symptom of a special form of irrationality. There's one point in the paper when he says, you have a lot of people doing what's rational for themselves at the expense of what would be best for the community at large or for the polity at large, right? Um, this is, I, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he says something to this effect. But to me, I see it as like, a lot of this isn't even rational for the self, right? If I had a child right now and they were like going through the schooling system, there's times where it almost seems like the claim he's making is that what's rational for them is to do as little work as possible to get the same credentials, right? Get the same outcome in the form of a degree with as little effort in the form of learning on their part. But me, if I'm extremely selfishly looking for my child to get ahead in life, I know very well how vacuous a degree can be. And I know very well that's not going to fly with a lot of employers. And the most rational thing that I could do from a purely selfish standpoint is to make sure that that child like learns a lot. The education sitting behind that credential is absolutely needed. It's, it's not at all that I want them to get that with as little effort as possible, when that often seems to be the implication in parts of the paper. Right, because presumably, you're do if you're looking out for yourself, assuming you have a good understanding of what the market needs and therefore what society needs, if you're truly looking out for yourself and you're doing so successfully, then you're going to do the thing that is needed so that society will value you. Because when society values you, you do well. And if you do something that society doesn't value or you do it in an inefficient way, then that hurts you. I think the challenge is that the credentials that exist, I think this was kind of getting to with the credential inflation and things like that. The problem is that the, the credentials that exist need to change over time because the needs of society change over time. And perhaps they don't change enough. And then perhaps people don't quite understand that they need to change. For example, the argument that if you are looking out for yourself, you are going to attain the highest education possible. That suggests that you know if you go into medicine, then you're going to become a doctor and you're going to specialize and you're going to become a surgeon and you're going to be you know on and on and on and spend you know, half your life in school so that you become a successful doctor. The reality is that the healthcare industry needs people who can care for patients. And you are probably much better off you know, doing a nursing program. And you will probably be paid well. You could probably find a job where you're directly caring for patients as like a nurse practitioner or something like that. And those are things that society is doing because society needs people with those skills and 
the credentialing system for doctors is too cumbersome. And so that suggests that doing what's best for you doesn't mean attaining the highest education possible. Doing the best for you means attaining an education that lets you extract uh, value from from the economy. If, if you're looking at it in purely economic terms, I think there's another aspect of it, which is you want to do something that provides meaning in your life. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't go into nursing if you didn't want to care for other people. It almost sounds like what you're saying, though, is that whatever the, the needs of, let's say, the healthcare industry are, that's going to line up with what's best for the individuals when it's not entirely clear if that's the case. Like, let, let's say the healthcare industry, they need a lot of people to handle, like, the logistics of ambulance distribution in some kind of way that, let's say it's very unglamorous, let's say it's less paid than other things. Is, is it not the case that if you take any individual who is like in that position and you're able to put them in a time machine, back them up 10 years and say, all right, like if you can do this again, what is going to be best for you? That a number of them wouldn't say, if it's like best for me, I'll go the higher paying positions. I would try to be a doctor instead of having gone to this. And again, I'd paint in kind of a fictitious lower standing position just because I don't, uh, I don't know what would fit in there. But that, do you see what I'm saying? It almost feels like there's something that doesn't jive with the claim you're making. I see what you're saying, but this is where it, for me, it's not purely economical. So so it is, it is somewhat economical, which is to say that if this position were really crappy and no one wanted to do it, then you'd have to entice people to do it by paying them. Uh, and so, you know, there's still a market there and the, and the, the pay for it will, will match the need for the job and, and the people who, who are able to do it uh, and so on. Um, but I think, you know, there's other things that people optimize for. People don't just optimize for the most income. People might optimize for, you know, I want a job where I can spend some time at home or I don't want to spend my mm -hmm. 20s in school. Yeah, we should use a word other than income because this is right, like why you're working for a nonprofit or we're all like interested in doing things related to education, even if that's not the most remunerative industry. It's maximizing self-satisfaction maybe or self-actualization. Yeah, I mean, I took a pay cut to do what I'm doing now. Mm. One thing I'm concerned about with both of your guys' examples is that they feel true to me for maybe the top fifth of SES folks, but they both feel untrue to me for the very bottom quarter. I'm not sure that... SES? SES. Or like just, I mean, think about people in poverty. I'm not sure that they have this privilege to think about what's going to make them most satisfied between being a doctor or a nurse practitioner or something. I think they're trying to figure out, or to Grant's point, I'm not sure they're thinking like, well, should I really like just get the credential or should I have this full-fledged education where I really understand everything deeply? Like it's what's on the test because I want to graduate high school. And if I can graduate, and maybe that's a flawed connection they have in their mind between studying deliberately for the test and just graduating high school, but that's their focus. And I think that's different than, or maybe a perspective we're missing in this conversation so far. That's a good perspective to bring in. I appreciate that. When you have a student, let's say they're like lower quartile, they're asking what's on the test just because they just want to graduate high school. Why is it that they want to graduate high school? What's motivating them there? I think the simple answer is higher earnings. I think that credential has value and the degree to which, especially for that student, I think that degree is going to have significant value. It'll also matter what they learned, but the credential matters. Two students know the same amount. One has a high school credential. The other doesn't like that matters. It does. Why does this matter to employers, right? Why is it why if you're some employee and you see someone who graduated high school and someone who didn't, what is it that makes you more willing to pay more money to the one with a high school degree? Uh, because it's a signal. Signal for what they learned? It's a signal for what they learned, which is associated with how high quality of a worker they will be. Let's say you're a manager at Target and you're you're considering uh, two different people that might work for you. One has high school degree, one doesn't. Is it really the case the reason you value the high school degree person because of what they learned? Because like what they'll be in target necessitates that understanding of biology that helped them pass in 10th grade. I'm not entirely sure that in the manager at Target's mind, there's going to be anything associated with high school academia about like, this is a skill set we want our, our employee to have. Certainly the ability to check off the checklist that is graduating from high school is yes. positively correlated with being an effective employee in whatever environment they're hiring for, right? I think that hits the nail on the head. It's kind of, are you able to uh, <laughs> complete a checklist, right? Are you able to, when people set out steps that might be a little bit hard or might be a little like intellectually demanding at that time, are you able to complete that in a way that's recognized by some external system in a way that's almost independent of what happens within that school, right? Where it might have as much value if what it took to get that high school degree instead of the academics that we consider what might be value later, just any other kind of hoop jumping just to test discipline, like long form over the course of four years style discipline. That seems to be the, in a lot of circumstances, the effect of why people value a high school diploma.
you're decoupling it to saying that we're only looking at positive associations with non-cognitive skills? Because the, the same problem-solving ability that's going to allow me to work effectively with my group in chemistry and lead to us getting a B and leading to me getting high school diploma, like that's the same, that's at least a related construct to what's going to let me be an effective employee, right? Well, I don't know. I'd push back on that because I think what you're looking for if you're hiring a clerk at a department store you're not looking for the sort of problem solving ability that it takes to do chemistry problems. You know, you really are looking for, look, I want someone who is going to show up to work on time every day, because if you don't show up to work on time, that's a hassle for me. And I don't want a hassle as a manager of the store. I just want you to show up to work on time. If I ask you to do something, I want you to, to like understand what I'm saying and do it. If I ask you to work overtime someday, I want you to be flexible in doing that, uh, knowing that, you know, I'll respect that and, and cut you some slack somewhere else. Like, that's what I'm looking for as a manager of a department store. And I would see the, the, the high school diploma versus someone without a high school diploma. Yeah, I'd probably look at that and say, like, OK, you've been socialized in an environment where you were you know, expected to do things that you might not have wanted to do and you were able to comply. I wouldn't see like, oh, you could do a chemistry lab, so you have problem solving ability. So uh, if the cash register breaks down, you'll be able to, you know, use your use your problem solving ability to figure out why. It's like, no, we have other people to do that. I think you don't have to go to the point of the cash register breaking down. For, like every cashier is going to have to solve problems to some degree, right? There's going to be a conflict with the customer. There's going to be something that goes awry. They're going to have to ask for help on something. Like there's going to be problems to be solved. That's fair. The main point I wanted to make is just that these all seem kind of removed from what the actual tasks set to the high schoolers are. Like, let me ask you this. If one person in their high school, they studied the standard things like chemistry and biology and whatnot, and that got them their high school diploma. And then another, it was just a, a weird outset. Like one of them, they were studying brine shrimp a whole bunch. And the others, they really understood the paper industry. Like that was a whole segment in like 10th grade. And another, they like worked in team groups to like grow a tomato plant together and like get it to yield the most. Is there a functional difference between those two schools, like the classic academic one versus the like still challenging, still requires group work, still requires thinking, but just a bizarre course load? So Grant, I get your point. I don't understand the point of your point. I guess that was where I'm stuck. Like, here's the point of my point. I just want to stay in the general topic of what is the goal of education. What's interesting to me is how the goal from the perspective of employers is often extremely different, but in a totally perpendicular way from the goals of the people setting these curriculums. And I almost feel like, what's the goal of the people who decided that biology should be a part of your high school or who decided that like every year you should be taking math? And I feel like what's interesting is that the goals of the curriculum designers seems to be producing academics that if, you know, when you have like the AP board, bring in experts to design what the AP test is going to look like. And a lot of that ends up influencing the non-AP classes surrounding or preceding it. Those people are often researchers in that field in some way. And it's just interesting that the actual time that we have our students spending ends up being as if they were going to become a biologist. The structure of a high school biology class is as if it is a first step in a long walk towards being a biologist or the steps in like a calculus class is as if it's the first one towards becoming a mathematician. Sometimes you can have these competing very different goals from different groups, like what the employer cares about versus what the curriculum designers seem to care about that don't really seem to conflict with each other, right? Like, all right, we're going to have our students do something challenging that demonstrates some sense of like showing up on time and like being able to work in groups and solve problems. Well, what's it going to be on? And then that's just a wholly separate question. And you can have these two competing goals that mesh with each other in a way that kind of works. So let me step back for a second, because I'm curious, so Grant, it sounds like your definition of what is the purpose of education, your answer to that question is something along the lines of giving people the ability to be successful in the economy. Mm -hmm. Stenhog, you haven't really expressed your opinion. <laughs> You've sort of been pushing back with some of the points of the paper, but I'm curious, you know, forget this paper that we read, because I'm assuming anyone who's listening to this probably hasn't read the paper. What is your view of the purpose of education? So it's hard to forget the paper in answering that, but I think it's a ridiculously wide variety of things. I think it's insane valuable to have a place where people from all different social classes are forced to interact at a young age. I think it's insanely valuable to have people solving problems and to be forced to do something on a day in day out basis. I think creating citizens to borrow terminology from the paper is really valuable. I think to Grant's point, like preparing workers and to be able to produce as a country, as an economy is incredibly valuable. I think having a place, our education system does not do this terribly effectively, but having a starting point where I, if I'm low SES, I'm sitting in the same room as someone that's high SES and I have the ability to... What does SES stand for? I don't know. 
the socioeconomic status. So it's a, a way of describing where you would lie on that, I don't know, family income or however you want to measure where you are relative to the other folks when it comes to resources. But it's a great equalizer. At least we wish it to be. And I wish it to be the chance for every kid, no matter how rich your mother or father is, to sit down in the same classroom and learn the same content and have the opportunity to apply to the same college. And then maybe we're never going to start on a clean slate, but it'll at least be a little bit cleaner as a result of the education system. The chance to, I don't know, like the arts and sports and all of those experiences are incredibly meaningful. I think people are happier as a result of the education system. That's why as soon as Grant pins his hat on, oh, we're just trying to prepare workers, or we're just trying to prepare people that can grab economic output for themselves and create economic output. That's where I like, I just have this allergic reaction because I think there's just such a wide variety. And maybe that's why I connect with the paper because he's basically saying there are a ton of different purposes. Some of them compete with one another. Some of them go hand in hand with one another. And it's really complicated. So I think my story of thinking about education is I didn't think about education. I mean, I was in it. I just I was the credential maximizer growing up. I would say I was trying to do well because it's what you're supposed to do. And it's what I was positively reinforced to do. But I don't know. I wouldn't say I had any great love of learning or anything. And then I do Teach for America. And it's just it's just just holy cow. This is messed up. You just see like inefficiency everywhere. You see bad outcomes everywhere. You see inequality everywhere. And I think the temptation from that is just to be like, man, we have to fix this. We have to reform this like it's broken. It needs fixing. And I found Labrie enlightening because he says like, yes, it's broken, but it's broken for a reason, it's not just broken because it's broken. It's broken because we're competing over goals. It's because we're politically unsure of what we want the output to be. But I think he's actually saying it's broken because we're leaning too far in the direction of what Grant and perhaps I would suggest, which is sort of interesting. Is he though? Let me read a quote, which I think is powerful. And perhaps this heads us somewhere. If not, we can cut it out. As a result of being forced to muddle its goals and continually work at cross purposes, education inevitably turns out to be deficient in carrying out any of these goals effectively, pushing harder for one goal, for example, seeking to promote advanced opportunities for high achievers through development of gifted programs only serves to undermine another trying to promote equal learning opportunities for the handicapped through inclusive education, for example. What looks like educational improvement from one perspective seems like a decline from another. All of this pushing and pulling leaves education institutions in a no-win situation for which whatever the way they move, they are goring someone's ox. Like that, that feels like he's very much saying, and this is where we started kind of disagreeing about if they're mutually exclusive, but that very strongly he is saying like they are in competition and we're pushing and pulling and we're never going to reach a maximum. Yes. But if you go further in the article, actually towards, towards the end of the article, he says, I've argued in this article that the biggest problem facing American schools is not the conflict, contradiction, and compromise that arise from trying to keep a balance between these different goals. Instead, the main threat comes from the growing dominance of the social mobility goal over the others. Peter, I literally was just about to read that exact quote. That's a fantastic comeback. And that's totally, 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 totally true. From my perspective, it was enlightening to think about them competing. And he's saying they're both problems, right? He's saying the bigger problem is social mobility focus. He's saying that the, the fact that there are these different goals that different people is muddling things. It's making it confusing. People are working at cross purposes. We aren't speaking the same language. Uh, people are looking for different things. Mm -hmm. I think his prescription there is just like, be aware that we're solving for multiple things here and be aware that there are trade-offs that we're making. And it's not always that one is always going to be better. I think that's the point he's trying to make there. But then he's making a further point, which says, and we've gone too far in this one direction. And I don't like that goal. I think what happened is he got a little untied, I guess, towards the end where like at the start, it's very academic. It's very, like you said, non-normative, right? It's just giving this lay of the land. But as you go on, he just seems like he's on a little bit more of a mission. That's an unfair way of phrasing it. It remains very academic, but it's like his true opinions start to seep out closer towards that end. Yeah. And I'm curious, I mean, maybe that's a valuable place to go, which is, is that true that you guys feel like you're advocating for the very thing that he's warning against in his paper? I think we come at it from a different angle. I mean, I started sort of sensing early on, to your point, Grant, like it, is, it starts out very academic and trying to document what's there. But I bristled a little bit at kind of the way that he characterized the social mobility that is sort of the capitalist angle. And because it's just the way that he was describing that, he seemed a little bit, you know, he seemed to lean a little bit more socialist, I guess. And, and then later on in the paper, I see, okay, he's quoting Marx, he's quoting Foucault. It's like, all right, <laughs> I, I could see this perspective. <laughs> um, and, and then, yeah, to your point, Grant, mm -hmm. towards the end, then he sort of comes down and says, like, the problem is there's too much of this sort of capitalistic tendency. 
And so Stenhouse, what resonated with you was the laying out multiple competing goals that are sometimes at heads with each other. Yeah. Because you, I mean, you listed like 11 or 12 different goals of education just there, right? The point I was struggling to make earlier is just that competing goals need not be mutually exclusive and can work hand in hand. The ones that you mentioned there, like the benefits of sports, like, okay, that's something that can go in there and doesn't need to kick out the benefits of social mobility, of this being an equalizing factor for others. I'm trying to think in my mind like, of a really good example where you have two competing goals that really cannot sit in the same room with each other. Because like when he brings up democratic equality, right, producing good citizens, I was reminded of this sort of urban legend in some like math teaching circles where there was some professor, he was like a mathematician, and he was uh, teaching an intro calculus course for the first time. And uh, so he goes to some of his peers because he has and he's like, oh, like, what am I supposed to teach in this calculus course? Like, oh, well, you're supposed to teach people about like what a derivative is, what an integral is, is uh, some limits, um, they should understand a little bit of the analysis behind it, how you define limits and mean value theorem, and uh, maybe a little bit of like infinite sums and things like that. that. That's what you should do. So he goes off and he teaches it. And then uh, the next day he comes to his peers. He's like, right, now what am I supposed to teach for lecture two? <laughs> so in this case, it's just that he's like this blissfully unaware mathematician who's cramming way too much into that first one. But from his perspective, he's like, this is only one lecture's worth of material. This is a little bit how I felt reading the notion of democratic equality and citizenship as a goal of education. I'm like, all right, we'll teach citizenship. How are you going to fill the other 95% of their time? It doesn't seem like a full-time job for the system. We can have a notion of citizenship that's not antithetical to purely economic goals. That's not antithetical to all the ones you list out, like you know, sports or working in groups or having a place where kids engage with each other socially. But that all feels like a necessary and part of building a citizen that's going to take a long time. It's more than a social studies class that it's going to take occupy 5% of your school time, right? This is an area where I think I would actually disagree with you, Grant. So I, I'm with you pretty much the whole way in terms of people looking out for themselves and that therefore meaning that they're going to connect themselves to the economy in a way that is useful to the economy and therefore useful to society. But what worries me about that purely capitalistic look at education is the fact that we do live in a democratic society and people are making decisions about policy indirectly through representatives and so forth, mm -hmm. but they are choosing those people. And if you focus purely on your interests, you know, I do wonder, are you going to be well informed enough to make good decisions that are best for the society? And is there value in sort of understanding the perspectives of other people? You know, how do you understand the perspectives of other people? You read a lot, or you have discussions about different cultures and or different, uh, mm -hmm. different viewpoints or different philosophies and things like that. And where do you get that? If that's not something you're interested in, and that's not something that is obvious that it will be valuable to your career, where does that come from? I wholly agree that it's not obvious that it'll be valuable to your career. I do think what's typically undervalued is how important understanding connections between people and uh, like, let's just say like the democratic functioning of society and how groups of people operate or what appeals to the ebbs and flows of culture through society of like people generally liking one thing, people generally like another, why they do, why they work together sometimes, why they don't sometimes. I think understanding all of that is hugely valuable for individuals. There's a disproportionate number of Silicon Valley CEOs with backgrounds in philosophy, which that's the kind of thing that seems unintuitive, right? That like, sure. Why would philosophy be at all beneficial in the context of running a tech company? And it, it seems to. I won't make claims or judgments right now on why, but like something about it does. And I think there can exist non-obvious reasons that people should study what constitutes a civic education or a, maybe a humanities oriented, like understanding connection between people that can still be justified from the same individualistic ends. I agree with you there. And that's why I was careful to say, you know, it's not obvious that that would be beneficial because it's not obvious that it's beneficial. And I don't think I've ever asked anyone in a tech interview to, to give me their opinion of crime and punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Just hasn't come up. <laughs> Uh, no one's ever asked me. But, but um, something about how affable they are or how much you connect with them during that interview, I wouldn't be surprised if that has its roots in their relationship with fiction. That seems like such a stretch. Do you really think so? Do you, do you not think like reading more fiction makes you connect with people better? I mean, that's, that certainly feels true. It feels like when I'm in an interview and I'm with someone, the, the causal agent behind connection is not having read fiction. I suppose it depends on what you mean by causal agent here, but I think you backtrack that causal chain long enough. What is it that made you 
read that, you know, when they responded to you in a certain way and you understood what they really meant by that between the lines, like what is it that built that intuition for you? I think a lot of that is backed up in one's relationship with things like stories. Like I think there's, all I'm saying is I think there's huge economic value in stories and how that's just another example of something that has a non-obvious benefit in the direction of the hard line that I'm just going to continue. So Grant, if you've got a technical interview for a software engineering job tomorrow, mm -hmm. what are you reading? <laughs> well, look, it's like right, like right now I'm reading about algorithms, right? There's a difference in long-term value for like, if, if that's your metric, right? Is what do you always read the night before? Like that, that can certainly be very different, but. But, but let's say we're devising some credential that's going to mm -hmm. credential software engineers mm -hmm. and we're, we want to pitch it to employers as valuable and, and as a strong signal that the people who have this credential, you could hire them without interviewing them. They're so good. Mm. You know, what does that program look like? Okay. This is a good way of phrasing it because you're kind of pushing me against the wall about where does reading crime and punishment fit into that credential? I guess, so you, like in your mind, this credential is something that you don't even have to interview them at all. It's not just that they're going to output good code. They're going to work well with the people in your organization. They're going to respond maturely to feedback. All of that is entailed in the credential. Yeah, because those are all the things I'm looking for in an interview. Um, now, I recognize I would, I don't think anyone, any employer would ever trust such a credential <laughs> blindly. <laughs> all right. But let's say that that's the goal. If that's the goal, then yeah, I think something beyond just engineering talent Maybe even part of that credential, I'd have like a test of your knowledge of literature or storytelling or something to measure how well you respond to the signals of other people when you interact with them. Okay. I feel like this credential would have to have an in-person oral exam component to it. If it's going to match the goals that you've set out here, it needs to have something beyond the engineering and it needs to be centered around human connection. Fair enough. So let's say that credential exists. It's a miracle. And let's say there's a competing credential that doesn't do any of that. It just teaches you software engineering, it just teaches you yeah. how to write code, teaches you algorithms, teaches you architecture, problem solving, debugging, all that stuff, pair programming okay. a little bit. Uh, so, so you have that one. It's a lot easier. You're not reading Russian literature. <laughs> you're, you're writing code, um, which is probably more interesting to you if you're interested in being an engineer, at least right off the bat. So let's say both of those exist. Mm -hmm. As someone who's looking for a job, which do you choose? This depends on how rational the employment market is, right? Like, do they value the first credential as much more highly as they should? Or do they not really care? Because like, obviously it's a lot, like you say, it's a lot more work to get credential A than it is to get credential B. And I'm just wondering, hey, what's the bang for my buck? Is that more work going to be a reward that I can reap? So let's say it is. Yeah, let's say, you know, it gets you an extra twenty, thirty thousand a year. Yeah, sure. Then I'll go read Crime and Punishment. Like <laughs> Yeah, like you pay me twenty thousand dollars a year more to read Crime and Punishment. And like, yeah, who wouldn't read so it? So then you have to so really then, hate So the now book. if you look at it from the employer's perspective, there's gonna be employers, I would imagine. If I were an employer, I could say, Okay, I could pay twenty thousand dollars more for people with this credential or twenty thousand dollars less for people without the credential. As an employer, I might think, huh, maybe I try to hire the people without the credential, but I do a couple interviews, because that doesn't cost me that much to do a couple interviews. And I try to gauge my own assessment of culture fit and teamwork and being able to integrate well with my team and so forth. I would think employers would do that rather than pay extra for this credential. I guess what I'm asking is why doesn't this credential exist? Oh, I, I think the main reason it doesn't exist is because it's extremely hard to actually quantify someone's ability to work with other people or their understanding of human connections. I just think it's very hard to put a number to that, but it's much easier to get a feel for that by either interviewing them or better yet, do a little bit of sample work with them. Either your line of questioning is genius, which is to make this debate over the purpose of education more practical. I had this joking idea on the, one of the last podcasts, but like, what if we were designing a school and we had a bunch of kindergartners coming in from all over the, I don't know, we're doing it in San Jose. Let's go to San Jose because it's a great place. And like, we have to craft the vision statement. And on top of crafting the vision statement, we have to hire the teachers with different <laughs> okay. expertises. We have to decide the curriculum. We have to decide the schedule for the day. Like that practicality behind answering this question just seems really, really useful. On the walls, I want Lavery's three goals. I want here at Ben, Ben, and Blue High, or kindergarten, we're going to build quality citizens, we're going to produce expert workers, and we're going to give everyone that walks through this door opportunity. 
that's what I wanted to say. Great, great. As long as point number two is printed in bigger font than the others. I'm all with you. Is that what you want? Is that what you want on the wall? We're going to produce expert workers and then you stand up and give your convoluted argument of why reading is actually connected to being an expert worker? Or do it's you not want convoluted to... <laughs> at all. It's not convoluted at all. I don't agree with any of this. <laughs> what, what, break it down. Why don't you agree? Well, I think there's two goals and not three. So one goal is preparing workers for the uh, for the job market, and that is driven by people's own motivations to seek education and seek the best for themselves. I think that's all one goal. And what I was getting at with that last line of questioning is this idea of if we're doing that, there are challenges that make it really hard to also prepare you to be a good citizen because through reasons of efficiency and shortcuts and everything else, that systematic process of creating a well-rounded individual is going to kind of fall by the wayside or it's going to happen in some other way. And so that's sort of the second, the sort of uh, democratic equality or, or creating a good citizen, or maybe it's setting a baseline level of education or whatever that is. I see that as a little bit of cross purposes to the purely utilitarian, you know, learn what you, you know, only what you need to in order to progress to what you want to do in life. Hmm. So what's it say on the wall, Peter? I walk in. What's it say on the wall of the school? I don't know. What's the vision? <laughs> I'm I'm a, I'm considering where my kindergarten kid's gonna go. Like, what's the vision you're pitching me? And like, what's the quick two sentence, one sentence, six word? Or Grant, what is it for you? We want everyone to lead a happy and productive life. I can get by that. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. The trick, though, is that part of living a happy and productive life is living in a well-functioning society. Uh, okay, so this is a little bit of a cop-out, I guess, because we, we both agree with that so hard, because like, how could you possibly disagree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I like Mr. Rogers, too. <laughs> with wanting your child to have a happy and productive life. So <laughs> should lead a miserable, useless life. <laughs> I want my kid to live a happy, productive life, and I want your kid to live a useless and miserable <laughs> well, life. Well, that's almost what point three is in that paper. That's sort of the I know. point. Which I, which, that's why I got right. to me. <laughs> oh, me that's too. not all point <laughs> three. Like, no, that's not even close to point three. <laughs> that is totally point <laughs> three. It's like there's a strict not, hierarchy, no. and the people at the top live happy, productive lives. The no. people at the bottom live miser miserable and unproductive lives, and, and it's every man for himself. <laughs> that's point three at the end of the paper. <laughs> There exists competition and there's value in being higher on the competition and people at the top want to keep it. Grant, you were saying that's a bad answer and you were going to give me a good answer. I think that's a fine thing to have on the wall, but I think the substance is what constitutes the best preparation for a happy and productive life. So if you want like something meaningful that Ben Ben and Blue Elementary School is going to put there, you need a subtitle. So I, I try to lay out the values like understanding principles of abstraction in some sense, like understanding logic and how it gets abstracted is an important thing for a mind to be able to do. Above that on the wall, I would have understanding human connections, right? This is, we want when our students come out of the school to have like a deep knowledge of human connection and everything that entails. Those are the two, actually. I think those are the two things I want. You want abstraction and human connection. Yeah, I want them to, and obviously to say understand abstraction is a very abstract thing, but I think people can kind of guess what I mean by that broadly, given my, <laughs> given my own academic interests. That second point I just think is very crucial, and I'll, I'll get entirely behind that. I'll tell you one thing that someone, if they heard my answer at the start of the podcast, they could have pointed to my own education and said, hey, wasn't this useless? Where I spent a lot of time learning the violin and learning how to um, play it and more broadly, like understand music. And, you know, they could say, hey, Grant, like, you don't, you don't really play the violin now. Like, you don't use music in an economically productive way. But one of the first things I ever did for, I guess, for money, uh, in some sense, was I was a street musician. So I grew up in Park City, Utah, and there's this Sundance Film Festival. A lot of people might know that comes there every year. And basically, my brother and I saw that, hmm, we've got a bunch of rich, fur-wearing Californians, like, wandering up and down Main Street who are carrying cash in their pockets. <laughs> what can we do to take advantage of this situation? And I think we were young enough and cute enough that it certainly made up for what we might have lacked in refined musical talent at that time. But that sort of started me on a binge of spending a lot of time like in high school just sort of street musicianing because it was fun. And I view that as extremely valuable, understanding what music resonates with people and what aspects of how I'm playing it correspond to more money in the case and things like that. I think there were a lot of much broader life lessons that came out of that that would have been hard to predict but not impossible to predict. And the, the premise of like what music teaches someone or what the notion of being a presenter and a performer can teach to someone and how that, how that informs the way that they lead their life such that they are more, you know, happy and productive and emphasis on the productive half here where that's kind of the counterintuitive one. Um, that I think there's a lot of little instances of that where things that seem to lack economic justification really can have one and they, they certainly aren't antithetical. 
And actually, I mean, if you look at three blue and brown videos and you look at my videos, your videos have background music. Mine don't. <laughs> You've got five times the number of subscribers as me. And I assume that's the only reason. It's the only reason. <laughs> um, yep, it is 100%. It's the background music. Musically, yeah. musically based. No, no, but, but more seriously, I mean, <laughs> there probably is some incremental value to your videos, even in an economic sense, to the fact that you know, there, there is that music that complements them so well. Maybe the music itself does something. But the lesson that came out from me spending a lot of time as a youth playing music is not what you hear musically in there. If you're a street musician right now, okay, you're, you're opening the case, you're on the street, you're about to play. What is the number one best thing you can do or think about if you want to maximize how much people are tipping? Is it producing the best sound? Is it making sure that it's crisp and in beat? Is it choosing songs that people like know and recognize? Like what, what is the number one thing you think you should do? I'm going to guess put a couple bucks in the hat. Uh, yeah. So you always have seed money. I always had one, five and two ones. That was the seed money. Right. Right. That's important. What else? I would think you'd need to be somewhat entertaining in an unusual way. Like what do you have in mind? I think if you just played reasonably well and like didn't really do anything else, and that would be less effective than like, I don't know, doing, I don't know if I can think of any example, <laughs> dancing or something. I don't know. Accosting people. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of like what it ended up being is basically how much energy are you expending? How much emotion does it look like you're putting into the song? And that can either mean for like a faster paced thing, like literal jewels of energy in terms of your movement, maybe not dancing, but you're like moving around to the rhythm. The cash cow back then was Hallelujah, you know, the, uh, the Leonard Cohen song and, mm. and sort of a, a string arrangement of that. And the key there is to get really into it in a more like slow, soulful, like close your eyes kind of sense. And those lessons that, you know, it, it actually did like take time to learn, like the quality of the music is secondary to those. I think that translates, I'm not the most like emotional in my videos, but it definitely is the case. And I, I think you guys kind of get the sense when you're recording anything, whether that's like podcast or videos, something about like being in front of the microphone, you like sap energy, like you're going to sound lower energy unless you actively think about like pumping it up in some way. And even in like listening back to these podcasts, by the way, sometimes I'm like, boy, it really sounds a little like monotone or lower energy, just because that's naturally what's going to happen if you don't think about it more. That I've tried to translate into the videos and I do want them to be kind of like calming. I don't want it to be like some dude yelling at you about math or like getting energetic in a fake way. But if I wasn't thinking about something, they would sound two times more monotone than they do now. And that's a lesson that I think comes straight from music and straight from like a notion of performance. I love that your dynamic range increased pretty significantly that was, over the last that was fantastic. Was fantastic. I was, I was, was much so more self-aware. It, <laughs> it's like how you can never have a conversation with someone about eye contact. It's all Because then every bit of eye contact or lack thereof in the conversation feels very it's unnatural. Over. I've got a meta question um, for you guys. I think this is interesting on the backgrounds we have and the perspectives we come from. So it seems as though you guys don't perfectly agree, but you, it, it's certainly the case that you guys are closer in agreement than I am to either of you. Why do we think that is? The cynic in me is going to say... Okay, I was going to say, and I don't believe this anymore, that Eater has much more exposure to the working world and the economy and like living in a pragmatic sense. I was going to say, well, but you, you're a student. You're, you're within the Stanford bubble right now. I mean, but I was that's... taught by Labrie. I've been indoctrinated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What is the difference? What is the source of difference here? I think that definitely plays on my view of things as I've been in the working world. You know, I worked in sales, a very capitalistic sort of endeavor and you know and the education system didn't didn't really do me any favors and i kind of had to find my own way and I, and I think all of that has sort of shown me the benefits of looking out for myself and and knowing what's best for me and taking advantage of the opportunities that are there but realizing that you know no one was going to do anything for me i had to kind of you know figure it out myself and do it myself and you know, having the tools available to sort of do that, whatever they were in terms of education and getting access to economic opportunity. You know, the more of those that were available, I, I feel like the, the, the easier it would have been for me. And I kind of look at it purely from that perspective. I recognize I don't have the perspective of having done that and failed, which might change my perspective. And it might be the case that Stenhog, you know, having been in a classroom where people were coming from all sorts of different backgrounds, uh, many of them who didn't have examples of people who had been successful, um, you know, and kind of seeing that the way that they might approach something like that. If you don't know anyone who has engaged with the system and been successful, it's hard to sort of imagine how you might do that. 
So a couple of thoughts. One thing that I didn't mention, but I think it's valuable. I'm curious to hear what you guys think of talking about social mobility versus social efficiency. And Lavery talks about this for a second. This is way oversimplified, but there's a kernel of truth to this, which is in the school that I taught, I would say the white students were coming from more affluent backgrounds and typically better resource to go off to college and be successful as a result. They were also more often coming on grade level etc. And from a social efficiency standpoint, it might be the case that then giving the the white students the training to go into higher education is advantageous and giving the black students the vocational training to go do something within the community that's going to earn less money. Like from a social efficiency standpoint, if you're just going to allocate people to positions, that might be what you would do and that might be the most efficient outcome. However, from a social mobility standpoint, like that is just the most disgusting thing you could ever imagine imagine possible. And that seems like a very clear conflict. From any standpoint, I think honestly, insofar as the social efficiency view is orchestrated from a broadened view public good perspective of trying to allocate resources. It's like, ah, even if for this particular student, it might be not the best thing for him. This is best for society as a whole. There's some line that library quotes within the paper, loosely to the effect of like, be honest, we only need a few doctors and lawyers compared to clerical workers and machine operators, right? How this is a consequence of a social efficiency standpoint. But uh, part of that feels antiquated in some sense. You like want to take a longer term view. Yeah. First of all, I, I totally agree. It's like that you can't imagine a more wrongheaded view than making that sort of distinction distinction based on social class and what opportunities you're going to give to people. But again, it's just, I don't feel like that is at odds with what is best for the individuals, because what is vocationally valuable now very well might not be. In fact, almost certainly won't be like truck drivers being kind of the classic example. If you fast forward 20 years from now, I feel like what is the best, most economically efficient, even from like a centrally planned, zoomed out public view for students who come from lower socioeconomic statuses, lower SES. I'm not so sure that it is that different. Yeah, and that's my beef with trying to separate the social efficiency of filling every job that society has with the least amount of effort per person, is sort of the idea there, versus the uh, social mobility, which is saying, you know, everyone should just try to attain as much education as they can. I don't see either of those as particularly useful goals. I see everyone should have the autonomy to achieve whatever education they personally believe they need in order to contribute to society based on their view of what society needs. Because what society needs needs will change over time. And this idea of social efficiency of, well, we don't need that many doctors. You know, I think the paper was written in 1996. And if more people had become doctors in 1996, I think our healthcare situation would be in much better shape right now. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said, either. It also seems to me, I'm not sure that us three actually disagree that much. I think if we actually got down to designing a school together and deciding how we're going to allocate time, it might just be semantics the way we're disagreeing in this conversation. I think we would wholly agree about the kind of experiences and the kind of outcomes we would want for our students. Well, I don't know. Would we sit down to design a school together in the first place, or would we sit down to design a series of credentials? Hmm. Can we just make that episode number eight? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great talker. <laughs> because here's the thing. I actually, I bet differences would arise in the implementation. It's a little bit like how, you know, when you said the goal is happy and productive students, it's like, we all agree. Eater and I agree much more on this paper than I anticipated agreeing with anyone. Yeah, I didn't expect that to agree with either of you either. <laughs> I bet differences would arise. <laughs> I'm like, boy, I have a pretty specific take on this paper on a few like specific points. And then like either articulates them more beautifully than I could. I'm like, huh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was sort of surprised by that. But I think we do still have like a difference, which is I do worry about the democratic equality aspect, not so much in terms of the equality, because I think a piece of democratic equality is that everyone gets the same level of education. I'm not necessarily on board with that because, you know, you may not want the same level. You may prioritize other things in your life and that's fine. But I do think that there is some need for some baseline level of education in some elements that everyone can sort of, uh, as a society, have a shared understanding. To flesh out the, I guess, specific ways that we might disagree there, slash if we do, it would require like laying down what in the curriculum or, and it maybe isn't like a specific class, but what time do you want your students to spend doing some task 
corresponds to this democratic equality goal that resonates with you as something that needs to be part of this that won't be achieved through the social efficiency one alone. Well, let me ask you this, Grant. I mean, since you seem to be more on the side of you don't really need to do anything special to prepare people to participate in democracy, is there anything you need to do? I mean, presumably you at least need to educate people that, that they can vote. To be clear, like you're saying anything you need to do mm -hmm. that wouldn't be achieved with a purely self-interested outlook. Yeah, yeah. So let's say I'm self-interested. I want to be a software engineer. I'm really interested in that. So I, I learn how to program. I learn problem solving, I learn algorithms, I learn architecture, system architecture. Perhaps I delve into some humanities, I read some fiction because I want to be socialized <laughs> uh, so, that I, so that I can actually get a job and, and keep it and not piss off all my coworkers uh, and get along with mm -hmm. them and, and be a good team player and, and understand how to value other people's opinions and understand that, that I don't always have to be right. And, and all of those other things that you need to do in order to participate in a team, I, I do all of that. Is there anything else I need to do in order to be a responsible citizen? Or do you think a society that is made up of people who have all followed that path and taken it in different directions towards their interests, do you think that that group of people, without anything additional, would fulfill the needs of creating and administering a government in a responsible way? Mm. <laughs> all right, you phrased it in a really good way, because... What I have to concede is that at some point you do need to tell them how voting works. And I'm not positive that that comes through on its own. No, no, but go beyond that. Okay, okay. I feel like there's a lot of benefits of being a member of your community, like on a local scale, not necessarily like how you function in the broad democracy of America as a whole, but just... So you should understand brine shrimp. <laughs> no, like, no, I, don't, I don't think understanding brine shrimp... What are brine shrimp anyways? My education system failed me. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Like you, if you went to Utah, you'd be screwed. I wouldn't get along. Everybody's over there bonding over the brine shrimp and you'd have no idea what they're talking about. Okay, here's part of why it's hard for me to come up with answers. I'm looking through my own educational history and trying to cite which parts of it were meant to make me a better citizen and how they were effective. And it's unclear if any of those aspects came from within the system itself versus having been part of groups and organizations and like recognizing the problems that can come about within group dynamics, right? And being able to kind of map that onto a society at large. And maybe some of that, it was like cleverly constructed that the way schools are and the way you like have little social groups or the way that you have like a team of people going towards a similar goal that need to work together. Like, ha ha ha, we fooled you into learning civic duty, but it certainly wasn't part of a curriculum. So I guess where I'm struggling is, I guess I'm not positive that schools as they are now really do that. It sidesquirts your question because you want to know what the optimal school would do. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say maybe it's helpful to know that you should vote. And maybe it's even helpful to say you should know kind of how a representative democracy works. You know, we'll assume you're in the U.S. And so you're electing representatives who make decisions on your behalf. And, and maybe it's useful to have some understanding of, you know, sort of constitutionally how they get elected and their term and the balance of power between the three branches of government if you're in the U.S. and that sort of thing. We'll start there. Is any of that useful? I was going to ask you, actually, do you think that's useful? I think it's helpful to know that. And why? Well, if you go to vote for president, mm -hmm. it's probably helpful to know what this person can do. Like, what qualities would you look for in a presidential candidate? So as to make sure that we have better presidents, right? If the voting electorate is better informed, this will make it so that our leaders are more capable leaders. That That's kind of the reason. Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, well, OK, let's say you didn't know any of that, but someone tells you, hey, it's voting day, go vote. Go to this place and here's this forum and it says, okay, here's some names for representative, for senator, for mm -hmm. comptroller. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, what, what is all this? Should you know that? Or should you just kind of pick the names that look interesting, see if there's any game show hosts you recognize and check that box? I'm not convinced that the people who consider themselves better informed about how the system works necessarily are making better decisions and it, that it's not still informed by things like, you know, subconsciously what political ads they saw or what groups they identified with before any of the candidates came up and that they started to identify just with the candidate in their own group rather than assessing them based on how well they fit into the system that they understand very thoroughly at that point. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. So you mentioned political ads, which is actually interesting because perhaps it's the job of political ads to teach you <laughs> the issues. <laughs> that, 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 that seems problematic in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, why not? I mean, any advertisement is teaching you about the product it's selling. Mm. That seems very removed from an ad teaching you what will be best for the system, I guess. But you said, I mean, you said that that's sort of like what informs people in their in their decision. This, and so this... they're they're going to look at that political ad and kind of in the light of everything else that they know about, you know, human behavior and, you know, come to some conclusion based on the different things that they see. Is that good enough? I guess, I guess what I'm saying is like, is that good enough or is there something else? Is it helpful to have some understanding of history? So if someone comes to you and suggests some sort of plan that has 
led to ruin in other societies that, that you aren't uh, drawn in by it. Certainly, that that's all very interesting. What I'm, what I'm trying to ponder is like, is that needed in a way that's removed from you maximizing things within your own life? Well, let's say you maximize things in your own life. And so like nobody really needs to know much about World War II in order to live your life, right? So let's say, okay, no one, no one learns that because there's just no, no real need to learn it other than just sort of an academic interest in it. And then someone comes along someday and says like, hey, you know, these Jews are causing a lot of problems. We ought to get rid of them. And, and they make a really compelling argument. And you're like, oh, that sounds really good. Instead of the reaction that everyone should have, which is like, that's terrible. And we tried that. And it was a bad idea. I do know what you mean. But World War II, that cuts right back to the reason that it's good to know, or a reason that it can be good to know about World War II is in understanding humans. And in particular, like man to man can be a dog. Or Is that how the quote goes? What violence can be at that level or what, what people will do inside organized systems that look and feel evil, even if those people didn't start off evil. Like the, the idea that this is an aspect of what humanity is, is useful within your own life. I think kind of the points that you want to cut to are those where it's useful to you to have everyone else in society know something and know how to do it, right? Like I want all of the other voters out there to be informed in certain ways. And in, in a sense, that's not something that's going to be addressed by like what the education system is doing for me. But there's got to be a number of things that I want the education system to do, because if I'm going to be ruled by the majority, I want that majority to be really savvy. And this is more or less like paraphrasing Labore. And this actually is a point about democratic equality that he made that did resonate with me, where some aspect of education really does have to educate your own ruler. Like in the same way that if, if we lived in a society that was run by a philosopher king, I want to make sure that his tutors, when he grows up, are great. And the analog of that is if we live in a democracy or a representative democracy, we want to make sure that the electorate is in some way like great at making their decisions. Somewhere in this vein, also, I, I do want to insert how important it is, even though I'm like viewing education as a private good and see that as a beneficial thing, I still think it's extremely important that it's funded publicly, that it is treated as a public good for equalization purposes, right? Where what's best for the individual's kind of has to be bankrolled on a societal level. And, and it's interesting to think about why that's the case, right? Why, why like a purely capitalistic schooling system wouldn't satisfy the goals that I would have in mind here or the very like self-interested. So, so there is some societal benefit. I, I agree with you on that, on that last point, because there, there is some benefit to, for example, if, you know, the best cancer researchers are people who don't have any capital. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You need to get them, you need to bootstrap them into the system. And like, fundamentally, the reason is because the value that is created by teaching a kindergartner or even an eighth grader or 12th grader really, really well does not show itself for decades. And we just, there's just not systems in place where you can have that much distance between where the value is added and where the reactive value comes back. It can be funded in a way that's purely private. And I think there's something analogous to be had for that in like the democratic equality goal, where in principle, there's this notion of like, what's best for me is if everyone is a good citizen and same goes for everyone and what's best for them is if everyone around them is a good citizen. So for like purely selfish reasons, it would be the case that I want citizenship. So it is the case that democratic equality is a natural implication of the social efficiency goal. That seems roundabout and distant in the same way that the economic value of the kindergartner is too distant from when the money needs to be spent. And in that way, they should, yeah, they, they probably should be treated as separate things. That's not a direct answer to your question about what things do I think constitute being a good citizen. But it sounds like then maybe you are actually in agreement with me, which is that I agree with your original point that, you know, there, there is this need to sort of incentivize people to follow their own path and give them the tools to do the best they can individually. But that there's a secondary need, which is that we also need some baseline level of responsible citizenship uh, provided to everyone in some way. I'm not sure I agree that we agree because it's too general as stated as such. I think if we do next podcast, do a like sit down, design a school type scenario and sit through what the curriculum should contain. I suspect our views on what constitutes being a good citizen or how important it actually is to vote or things like that might surface. That would make it come out beautifully. Like that, that exercise would make it come out beautifully. But Ben wants to design a credential, so we're going to have to start there. We're going to have to debate it. Okay, we'll do a credential design next time. That's good. Well, no, my, my question wasn't, I want to design a credential, you want to design a school. My question was, which is the thing you should design if you wanted proper education? Where do you start? Mm, okay, that's a, that's a crazy good question. I don't know. I'd have to think on that to give a solid response. You got till next episode. Any, anything to close us off, Stenhaug? I think that's good. That conversation was all over the place. I mean, it was fun, but I made a table of everyone's views and to be able to cross-reference them with color coding. That's for sure. That's for sure.
Hello again, Grant here, wrapping things up for you on this fine afternoon. Well, at least it's a fine afternoon for me. I'm looking out the window, looking at some hummingbirds. Always nice. So if you're enjoying the podcast, you know, the best thing you can do to help out, just, you know, keep listening. And even better than that, if you want, is just let people know about it. You know, I think the funny thing about podcasts is they, much more than any other medium, really spread through word of mouth. Uh, maybe a little on social media, but it's much more reliant on people-to-people -people connections. You know, if I think of the trajectory of my own YouTube channel, I have to give a lot of thanks and gratitude just to the fact that YouTube is a platform, that it can recommend things. And I, and I saw a big spike kind of early on, I think between maybe 5,000 and 20,000 subscribers. It was 100% because for some reason the channel fell into the good graces of the YouTube recommender engine. And great, right? Like I benefited from that. Uh, but podcasts, there's, there's kind of a notion of that here or there, but much more than many other things. It's just if you let people know about it. And I would say in doing that, it's probably important how you sell the thing, because I think if Ben Ben and Blue was described as a podcast about education, it would feel, well, kind of disappointing, right? I mean, none of us are actually experts on education. It is not a laser-focused, journalistic, expository piece. It's just us trying to have a thoughtful conversation about it. And I really think what I'm trying to simulate here is if you were maybe going out to dinner with the three of us and just wanted to have a conversation about the things on our minds, this is what it might be like. Because I've, I've certainly had podcasts where I go into it thinking of it as primarily informational, and I get a little bit sick of the hosts, I think, if they seem to meander a little bit too much, even if I like their personalities. But then there's other ones where it's much more about just the hosts being like little friends in my pocket. So that's all I'll say. If you, you know, if you do want to share it with other people, I do think framing can kind of matter. And also, if you are enjoying these, if these add some value to your life, I will mention there is that Patreon page. You'll notice we don't have ads strewn throughout this. Right now, I do kind of like the vibe of just an uninterrupted conversation. And at the moment, that means basically operating at a loss, because we do use an editor for this so that it doesn't take too much time away from our main obligations. And it's funny, I was actually just at a conference associated with Patreon, and maybe I'm just coming off of the mimetic influence of that, but it just really does feel like the future of the internet is one where the connection between content creators and content consumers is much more direct, and the advertising intermediaries play a much smaller role or a less essential one in the lives of creators. And that's a future I want. You know, my own views on advertising are a bit nuanced. I do think there is such a thing as good advertising, something that benefits everyone. It's something I strive for on my channel. But on the other hand, I really do think most of it is not good and just would be better replaced by a more direct connection between creators and consumers. All of the incentives become much better aligned there. So if that means something like $1 per show of value that you feel like you receive, that, well, that's something that we'd be really grateful for.